The McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle is a truly great aircraft. Built from the lessons of air combat learnt over Vietnam, the Eagle was built to be the most capable air superiority aircraft possible at the time. The airframe's sheer versatility has seen it undergoing continuous updating and modification since it first entered service in 1976, meaning it has expanded from its original design parameters to become not just a formidable fighter, but a first-class strike aircraft as well. And in the Eagle's latest iteration, the F-15EX, the aircraft is going to provide the backbone of the United States Air Force for several more decades to come. Indeed, in terms of the type's sheer popularity amongst airheads, I can only think, really, of one other aircraft that matches it. No! I'm talking about the F-14 Tomcat. This epic aircraft, the naval contemporary to the F-15, has a huge fan following, in no small part created by a rather brilliant bit of US Navy propaganda. I mean, recruiting genius. And I'll admit, both these types share a special place in my affections. But just as when you have two great athletes in a sport at the same time, you have rivalry. And though it isn't remembered so much today, in fact the F-15 at one stage looked like snuffing out the F-14 completely. Allow me to explain, and bear with me because this essentially is the story of two aircraft. Actually more like three. With the F-14, Grumman really did manage to cram the proverbial quart into a pint pot, even if the Tomcat was a pretty big pint pot. Designed to be the ultimate naval interceptor and escort fighter, the F-14 originated from the failure of the F-111B and the TFX program, which had sought to create one basic type to fulfil such diverse roles as long-range intruder for the United States Air Force and carrier interceptor for the Navy. The F-111B was a costly fiasco, but important lessons were learnt and the Navy, who had been extremely dubious about the whole concept anyway, were able to turn to Grumman to apply those lessons to build them the aircraft they truly wanted. Beginning development in 1966, when it became apparent the F-111B was in trouble, the F-14 was selected to be the Navy's new fighter interceptor in 1969. And it was a remarkably ambitious design. The Tomcat employed the most powerful and advanced sensors and weaponry available, with a two-man crew to optimise efficiency in long overwater missions. But it also managed to combine this with a surprisingly agile dogfight performance that outmatched just about anything before it, and could, in the right circumstances, match that of the new F-15 Eagle that was in advanced development at the same time for the USAF. Now, I know that's a contentious statement, no doubt people are typing furiously, but don't take my word for it. There is a really interesting lecture given by Mike Simonera, one of the principal designers of the F-14, and he talks about the agility of that design and its development. And his assertion is that the F-14 could take the F-15 in the right circumstances. The lecture is well worth a look if you're interested. I shall link to it at the Military Matters website, which you can find in the description. But to get back to the point at hand, all this sheer capability naturally came at a great financial cost. And as Simonera put it, in those days, you paid for aircraft by the pound. And that proved so with the Tomcat. The F-14 was expensive, considerably more so than the F-15 Eagle. And, as part of the efforts to save on those costs, Grumman sought to utilise two of the elements developed for the failed F-111B. After all, $400 million had been spent on the so-called Sea Pig by the time it was cancelled in 1968, and that was far too huge an amount to simply be completely written off. The first thing carried over was the AWG-9 radar and fire control system, which was fine because it was set up to work with the Phoenix missile. Indeed, the ability to use this missile was a principal requirement for the new fighter, as the US Navy was increasingly concerned about the large numbers of advanced, long-range Soviet bombers coming into service, and, more especially, the extremely fast and capable anti-ship missiles that they used, and which had been expressly designed and built with countering the US Navy's carrier task forces in mind. So that was fine. But Grumman also used the TF-30 engine, and this, alas, was a significant problem. In fact, both Grumman and the Navy both knew that this engine was creating issues even during development of the F-111B, 
and with the F-14, the initial plan were for Grumman to produce a limited run of less than 60 F-14As, which used the TF-30, then switch production to the F-14B, which would use much improved Pratt & Whitney F-401 engines. But in 1971, costs had become a serious issue, and it was spelled out that the F-14 would have to use the TF-30 for the foreseeable future. And this caused quite a lot of concern at the Pentagon. The TF-30 was a powerful engine, but it had some vicious stalling tendencies, as well as problems with fan blades coming apart. And the powers that be, though enthusiastic by the prospects offered by the new Tomcat as it began flight testing, were wary. After all, they had had one high-profile and hugely expensive interceptor project collapse. What happened if another one was to go the same way? And naturally, as big defence contractors love the opportunity to steal lucrative contracts from their rivals, McDonnell Douglas was swift to swoop in with a potential alternative. The F-15N Sea Eagle. This was a comparatively straightforward navalisation of the F-15A, which hadn't yet flown by that point, but was in a state of extremely advanced development. Additional features that would be added to a naval F-15 were folding wingtips to allow the Sea Eagle to stow more efficiently on board carriers, plus a much stronger tail hook. The F-15A did already have a hook for cutting down landing runs at airbases, but it was recognised that the difference in strain from landing on a deck was much greater, requiring also a beefed up undercarriage. But to minimise complexity, the F-15N would use the same ANAPG-63 radar as its land-based kin, as well as the standard weapon fit of four Sparrow and four Sidewinder missiles, along with the integral 20mm Vulcan cannon. Indeed, the models that McDonnell Douglas put together for their proposal showed the aircraft also carrying Harpoon anti-ship missiles, which, considering that that itself was only in design phase, shows an interest in forward thinking by the Eagle designers. This aircraft would ironically provide the commonality that had been the goal of the TFX project that had created the F-111 and by extension the F-14 and looked to be a much cheaper option. And the savings could have been substantial. According to author Bertie Simmons, the F-14A cost $38 million, while the F-15A came in at $28 million each. Even accounting for extra expense that would be necessary to build the F-15N for service use, because of the additional complications in its design and additional development work required, it still would have come in cheaper than the F-14. Plus, additional savings in the total production run of the F-15 by all users would likely have been made due to the extra numbers being constructed had the Sea Eagle been selected. But though these savings would have been welcomed, and to be frank, the F-15N would likely have made a fine carrier fighter, it still lacked a critical aspect that the US Navy really, really wanted compatibility with the AIM-54 Phoenix missile. The Navy had its sights firmly pinned on this weapon, which was the most formidable air-to-air -air missile on the planet, and considered it key to defeating the threat of long-range Soviet bombers and their lethal missiles. The proposed F-15N was only armed the same as the F-4 Phantom it was intended to replace, and though it was a far more formidable aircraft than the Phantom, the Navy wanted the Phoenix. So McDonnell Douglas came up with the F-15N-PHX, which was planned to be able to carry four of the lethal new missiles, though notably the model they made carried six AIM-54s, along with a couple of Sidewinders. I'm going to put that down to optimistic marketing, because the Phoenix was both huge and heavy, and even the Tomcat, which was expressly designed to be able to carry six of these monsters, very rarely did so and apparently could only land safely on a carrier with minimum fuel if carrying this loadout. For fire control, both McDonnell Douglas and Hughes stated that they believed the ANAPG-63 could be configured to be compatible with the AIM-54, but consideration was also given to fitting the AWG-9 in the Sea Eagle's nose. However, the estimates were that the F-15PHX would have weighed an estimated 4,090 kilograms, that's 9,000 pounds, more than the baseline F-15A, a substantial increase which would no doubt have impacted performance. But the idea was promising enough that the Sea Eagle concept received consideration up to the highest levels. In 1973, a Senate subcommittee convened to consider in which direction the US Navy should go with their new fighter. This led to one member, Senator Thomas Eagleton, suggesting that some Sea Eagles be built and a fly-off between them and the F-14A be arranged to decide the matter. But that was not to be, and the F-15N Sea Eagle 
was to remain essentially a design study and proposal only. The Navy was very much of the opinion that the F-14 was the right aircraft for them, almost certainly correctly as it was built very much to their requirements and not a hash up of an aircraft originally built for the Air Force, an idea that the F-111 saga had firmly soured them on. So it was that they went with the Tomcat, while the USAF got their eagles. But the whole matter does lead to some interesting points of speculation. What if history is a nebulous thing? Indeed, it isn't history, it's fiction. But it is interesting to consider what might have happened had the F-15N been adopted. Would it have been as good in the role of fleet defence as the F-14? Probably not, though it wouldn't have suffered from the engine issues that bedeviled the F-14A for a third of its surface life. Plus, it might well have meant that the F-18 would have proven unnecessary, and maybe navalised versions of the F-15E Strike Eagle would have replaced the A-6 Intruder and A-7 Corsair in service, meaning US carrier air wings had basically a single aircraft design on deck. It would also mean that the F-15N would likely, unlike the Tomcat, still be the principal aircraft employed by the US Navy today. As said, all complete speculation, but it does make the McDonnell Douglas F-15N a very interesting what-if aircraft. And if you want to know more, I recommend F-15 Eagle by Bertie Simmons. There isn't a great deal out there on the Sea Eagle concept, but Simmons' book has pretty much all the relevant information, along with a comprehensive history of the F-15 in all its forms. And the book's publishers, Moulton's Books, is offering a 10% discount on purchases to viewers of this channel. All you have to do is go to their website and use the discount code EDNASH10 when you purchase. That code is good until the 31st of December 2023, and you can use it multiple times if you want to. I don't get anything from this, it's just my way of giving appreciation back to all you folks. Link to Moulton's Books is in the description. Have a browse and see if there's anything of interest. Have a good one, and I'll see you all again soon.